Okay, let's take a look at how we define the class functions. So where we left off in the last lesson was here. We have our fraction class. It's defined or declared. I prefer to say this is its definition here. It's defined in fraction.h, the header file. And again, we have class fraction. And in the public section, we have four functions. That's the interface between the user. And the user in this case is actually a programmer, not somebody using a piece of software. It's the programmer using this type. It's the interface between the user and the private section, the member data of the class. We also remember that when we declare a fraction, in this case we've declared fractions f and g, then each of those two objects contain two ints, a numerator and a denominator. That's it. f has two integers, a numerator and a denominator. It doesn't contain copies of these functions, but each one of these fractions have access to these functions. So the compiler, when it comes across this definition, it will put these four functions onto a function table associated with the type fraction. And any fraction object, in this case f and g, can access those member functions. They can call the member functions. But each one of these objects, f and g, actually do contain two integers, labeled numerator and denominator. Remember, we cannot directly access the private member variable of that object. I cannot assign directly 7 or anything to the numerator of that object f. But I can call the functions. f can call readin, it can call print, it can call unreduce. Okay, so what do we do with the definitions? We're going to create a CPP file. It's called the implementation file for the fraction class. We'll pound include fraction.h so that that file knows of the fraction header. It knows the definition. It doesn't have to stumble over what a fraction is. We'll pound include IO stream in case we need it. And in this case, I'm going to use a little bit different statement of what I'm going to use from the standard namespace. I'm, I'm going to use this different scoping technique using standard cout and using standard cm. The readin function I want to define is simply going to allow the user of a fraction to bring information into the numerator and the denominator. I will prompt for and read in the numerator and the denominator. When an object calls this function, what's going to happen is we'll get this prompt to the screen and somebody enters 3 at the prompt, then the numerator is going to take on the value of 3. Now the big question is, this is if I do this, f is calling the read in function, what happens to this 3? Does it go into the numerator for all fractions? The answer is emphatically no. It is f's numerator that becomes 3. Not everybody's numerator. f is the calling object. If g calls the readin function, then when the prompt comes from the numerator and somebody inputs 5, then g, its numerator, is going to be 5. Not f's, not everybody's. It's the calling object that's going to be changed. So that's very important to understand. It seems to quite often be a stumbling block to the understanding of how this works. Continuing on, I want to define the print function. So the print function is simply going to output the numerator and denominator in some nice format. Of course, we'd love to be able to do that in another way. Let's suppose that when f calls the readin function, we enter a 3 and 4 for numerator and denominator. Then when f calls the print function, the format's going to be a parenthesis, the numerator, the denominator, and a closing parenthesis. So you see m underscore numerator. Whose numerator is it? It's the calling object's numerator. Whose denominator? The calling object's denominator. If g reads in 8 seventeenths and then calls its print function, 8 seventeenths is going to come out, not 3 fourths. One more thing I want to point out. Notice the difference here. I have to scope the functions. I have to tell the compiler this is for the fraction class. And this guy right here is called the scope resolution operator. Without that, it won't compile. OK, moving along, I'm going to define the reciprocal function. Now, the reciprocal function 
And again, notice that I have scoped it. The reciprocal function is going to return a fraction. So if I'm going to return a fraction, I'm going to declare one locally, call it returnable, and then I'm going to set the numerator and denominator of returnable to be the denominator and numerator of what? The calling object. If I do this, if I say g is equal to f dot reciprocal, who's the calling object? f is the calling object. m underscore denominator and m underscore numerator refer to the denominator and numerator of f, the calling object, in this case. Not all, f is not always the calling object, but in this case it is the calling object. And that's going to be assigned to the numerator of what? Returnable. That is a temporary local variable inside this function. Now at this point you might be saying, no, wait a minute. I can't directly modify the numerator of a fraction, but you can in a fraction member function. This is a member function of the fraction class, and you can directly access member variables in a member function. So this is legal. This is fine. I just can't do this outside of a member function. Anytime inside of a member function that you refer to a particular member variable, it's the member variable of the object that is calling that function. In this case, f is calling the function. What I've done is I've declared a local fraction. I have defined it, built it the way I want to, and then I'm going to return it. And that's going to get assigned to g. And the unreduce function. You know how to reduce fractions. We're going to unreduce fractions simply because it's easier. Okay, I'm going to pass in an integer. I'm going to multiply both numerator and denominator by that value and replace numerator and denominator by that product. If my fraction was 3 quarters and I pass in 2, it's going to be 6 eighths. So again, if I have f was 3 quarters and f calls its unreduce and I pass in 4, okay, and then f calls its print, what am I going to get? What I'm going to get is, remember it starts out as 3 fourths, it's going to be 12 sixteenths. That's what's going to come out to the screen. f is the calling object, f gets changed. Notice that the member variable actually does get changed in this function. All of this goes into its very own file called fraction.cpp, along with the first function definition which didn't fit on this page. How do we use these things? In this main, I'm going to declare three fractions, f1, f2, and f3. And again, I have to make sure to pound include the header file so that this new type makes sense to the compiler. And again, it's always type name, always in every declaration. The compiler looks to see that the fraction class has been defined. Each one of these entities, f1, f2, and f3, they have two integers. They have a numerator and a denominator, and they all have access to those public functions. So f1 will call its read-in. What does this mean? Let's suppose somebody enters 3 at this prompt and 4 at this prompt. It means that the numerator and denominator of that object, the calling object, they're actually going to be changed. So that when you print, when f1 calls the print function, not its print function, but the print function, then we're going to output the numerator and denominator in parentheses and a slash. And that's what it'll look like. f2 is going to call its read-in function. And let's suppose that we read in two sevenths. 2 and 7. When it prints, then f2 is going to call the print function. Then you get a parenthesis. You get f2's numerator, slash, and its denominator, and a parenthesis. f2 is going to call its unreduced function and pass 2 in. 2 goes in for m. That's 2. That's 2. So its numerator is multiplied by 2. Its denominator is multiplied by 2, and f2 is now going to print, and what do I get? I get parenthesis, and I multiply by 2, so it's going to be 4 fourteenths. f3 is going to be assigned f1 calling its reciprocal. Remember the reciprocal function returns a fraction. What happens is when control passes to this member function, we're going to create a temporary fraction in the function call it returnable, we're going to build 
returnable, we're going to assign to its numerator the denominator of the calling object. So this is the denominator of the calling object. The calling object is f1. Let's see, the denominator was 4, the numerator was 3, so the numerator of returnable is 4, and the denominator of returnable is 3. And again, I can directly access these because I'm in a member function. And I'm going to return returnable, which was 4 thirds, and that's going to get signed to F3. So if F3 then calls the print function, it's going to output 4 thirds. Now look at the last line. What happens when I try to assign to F3 F1 plus F2? What do you think is going to happen? It's not going to work. Why not? Well, it's because this function, that operator plus, is not defined. It's not defined for what? It's not defined for the fraction class. It's defined for the basic primitive C++ types, but it is not defined for fraction. Can we define it? Yes, we can, and we will do that in a future lesson. We're going to define those operators. We can define any operators we want. Uh, almost. There are certain operators we can't. If this is not going to compile, which it won't, it's not going to compile at this point, then the astute student would think, oh, no, wait a minute. What about this operator? We used that, and we had no problem. What's up with that? Well, it turns out that there are certain operators that are automatically defined for every user-defined type and the assignment operator is one of them. That is defined automatically for you. The definition that is created by the compiler for assignment is fine for what we want to do at this stage of the game, but when you get into more advanced techniques and uh, memory management issues, it's not going to be good enough. You'll see soon enough in a, in a future course that the compiler-generated definition for that operator won't be good enough. Can you define it yourself? Yes, you can. Okay, and uh, we just may do that this semester. But if you don't, it's okay. So long as you have no uh, pointers or dynamic memory in your class. Since you don't know what that is right now, it's not a problem. So you've seen the basics of how you can create a class and declare objects of that type and define the functions member functions, and how they work. We'll look at more in the next lesson.